Well, I'd like to talk today a little bit about um, some places I've been and some people I've had the pleasure of knowing, um, mainly in the Peruvian Amazon. I'd like to, to introduce you uh, to the Achua. This is the Apu Domingo. He's one of the Achua indigenous people that live in the, the northern Peruvian rainforest, which for me really is one of the most beautiful places in the world, one of the most special places in the world not just because of the rich natural environment, the biodiversity, but also because of the people that live there. In this area of northern Peru, I've been working with the Achua, who um, are amazing pot makers. This is uh, a pot that they use to prepare masato, which is, I guess, their beer. It's uh, a drink made out of manioc, which is mashed down and chewed by the woman and spat out and the enzymes in the saliva cause it to ferment. And it makes a slightly alcoholic, very nutritious drink, which tastes slightly of sick. <laughs> but uh, it's, uh, it's an obligation whenever you're in the community. You, you, have to, you don't have to drink it, but it makes a big difference if you do and you join in and drink it. So they're making pots. The men are busy making canoes. Uh, the Atua are some of the best canoe makers I visited in the Amazon. They have this skill where they hollow out a log, leaving only a half an inch thickness all the way around, and they burn a fire underneath and the whole thing opens up into a beautiful canoe at the end of the day. And life in, with the Achua is all about community and it's all about your environment, hunting and fishing. This is a, a fishing expedition with uh, the whole extended family. I think the whole community is actually participating here. And the way they'll fish as a big group like this is they use a plant called waka, which they grow in their gardens, and they mash it down into a thick paste in huge quantities, and they go up right to the headwaters of the stream and put this paste in baskets and spin that around, and the paste goes out into the river, and it suffocates the fish, but it doesn't kill them. The fish, whilst they're suffocating, as this waka moves down the river, will come to the surface gasping for air, and the people will walk down just picking up the fish or sticking a spear through them and gathering the fish as they go down. And children join in, adults join in, you get amazing pickets. These rivers are full of little fish. And after the whacker goes down river, all the fish that survived, they, uh, all the fish that aren't picked up, recover and go on to live another day. And the actual will know that this stream has been fished in this year and they'll leave it a year or two. Uh, before they go back to this, this particular stream again. Of course, they're also hunters. I'm not a very good hunter. I managed to carry this wild boar for about um, half an hour before the vines dug too much into my shoulders. These guys will carry these kind of animals and bigger for, for an entire day across the forest to bring them back to their families. And they'll be eating wild boar, birds, monkeys, um, a lot of endangered species, but the endangered species live there. They've been hunting them for years, and they carefully manage them over a huge wide area, and uh, they continue to be. It continues to be one of the most biodiverse parts of the Amazon. And when you get back to the community, it's all about village life. This is after the fishing ex expedition. Everyone is together. Everyone's eating, happy, and really, for me, what the reason why I've wanted to stay there. It's really one of the happiest places I've been. You look at the children that live there, the, I've never seen such happy faces and such happy children. But now, the Achua, as well as making pots and hunting and fishing and making canoes, they've been making maps and drawing maps of their territory and their hunting grounds and where they live. And they've been using, learning to use GPSs so they can get geographic co coordinates about where the hunting grounds are, where their ancestors died and are buried, where their old houses are. And why? It's because this beautiful Amazon, the place they live, is to stop it becoming something like this. This is a, a waste pit from oil spills in uh, the Corrientes River. This is uh, probably about three days travel from where this particular group of Achua that you saw live. This is another group of Achua, they live in a, it's a different river basin. And they've had um, oil companies working there for 35 years. 
the U.S. company Occidental Petroleum was there from 1970 until 2000, and they left huge amounts of devastation. Oil pits like this, which as soon as it rains, continue to leach out into the environment, spreading heavy metals uh, and carcinogens into the rivers where people fish that build up in the food chain of the animals that they hunt. And it's not just a historical problem. Right now in Peru and in other Amazonian countries, petroleum exploration is a big thing. This is a map of Peru. The um, eastern side is the Amazon. It's about half the country. And all those squares you see dotted over uh, are new oil concessions. Previous to 2000, there was only really one big oil operation in the Amazon, the one that you, you, you saw that picture of. And over the last five years, this has expanded hugely, partly because of the rising price of oil, partly because the Peruvian government is currently really pursuing a model of development which is all about extractive industries. Uh, and I think also it's related to the changing politics, international politics. South America is a much safer place to get your oil from, even if it's more expensive than the oil quality is, quality isn't as good. It reduces your dependence on the Middle East. And the Latin American countries are supposedly easier to manage the Western governments. And this is just a closer up, so you can see the northern area. Just to, to show you where people are, the Achua, where I should, who do you show the pictures of, living here. And the Achua with the contamination live in this region over here. The Achua, who have been making maps, who still have a nice way of life, have two oil concessions all on top of their territory. Those oil companies haven't started working yet. They've been trying to work for the last 10 years, but they haven't been able to because of the Achua have been fighting them. And the latest tool they've had are the maps. Because they want to stop the destruction of the resources, the destruction of their hunting grounds, the destruction of the uh, places where their animals that they hunt will live. They want to stop the contamination and the inevitable oil spills because it's pretty much impossible to run an oil operation in the, in the jungle without something happening. We all know when you bring a camera along to the jungle, it, it, it breaks after a few months. Humidity is not friendly with technology and electronics. And the same is true for oil operations. Something goes wrong almost inevitably. Things get spilt. The problem with oil is what do you get up from the ground isn't like the petri put in, the uh, in your car. It's, uh, it's crude oil. And in the Amazon, it's very heavy crude oil. It comes up from the, water, uh, from the ground. About 80% of it is uh, what they call production waters. It's uh, a highly saline water that's full of heavy metals that come up from 2,000, 3,000 meters down in the earth. It carry with them a, a lot of heavy metals. Um, and they also, the crude itself, as there are certain hydrocarbons, such as aromatic hydrocarbons, that dissolve in water and are carcinogenic and build up in the food chain. They're bioaccumulative. In the Corrientes, where was a health study two years ago, where the oil operations have been for the last 35 years, they found 99% of the children that they studied had levels of cadmium in their blood that were over safe levels. These kind of things are causing developmental problems, uh, health problems, and cancer in the adults. So the Achua and the Pastaza, in order to draw, uh, stop it, one of the things they're doing is drawing maps. And these maps are showing that what looks like an empty space, what looks like a space rich for oil development, is not empty at all. And it's directly going to affect their lives and affect where they live. The Amazon isn't um, empty. And it isn't just one great lump of, of green. It's very specific and there are certain places where certain things come from. The pots that you saw, the clay for those pots, in each community's territory will maybe only come from one or two different places. The canoes that they make, there are particular canoes that are good for, uh, particular trees that are good for making canoes. Very well, they'll have a particular place where they will know that those trees grew. The leaves for the roofs of their houses, uh, the areas for hunting, where they know the animals gather around fruiting plants at a certain time of year. Every single thing that is, has, its, has its particular place. Every single part of their territory is important. And we got involved with these maps because the Achua came to us. They've been fighting the oil company. They said, we want to show the world why 
our territory is important to us, why we don't want an oil company there, and we want to show them how it will affect our lives and how it will affect our rights. So we started drawing maps. And the, as you can see, there are the most amazing map drawers. They're uh, artists, and it's all about communication. It's about showing someone why this is full. And I don't go and draw maps. We don't go and draw maps. It's, it's all about working with the community to help them draw maps. And this is about empowering people as well, because part of the bigger problem is that people are looked down upon. People come from the outside and tell people what to do and devalue people's traditional knowledge and their own knowledge, make them think that in this new world, what they have isn't va valued. And everything that comes from a Western education is what really, really matters and really helps. So it's about turning around the tables. And a lot of that is to do with the way you interact with the community, the way you work with people. So here is my colleague, Alia. Um, working with the Atua, this is when we started the project and we're talking about why people's territory is important. And rather than standing up at the front of the village and lecturing people about what we're doing, it's about listening to them and what they've got to say. And it's about the physical relationship as well, the very fact that Adia is sat there on the ground and people are standing around them. It changes the dy dy dynamic about between people and it makes them realize that they know something. So this extends all the way to the mapping. It's really hands off. This is a, a mapping workshop going on in a community. I got it started, I handed over the pens. People were a little nervous at, at the beginning, but with a little encouragement, you just walk away and leave them and they'll, they'll start going. When we worked more and more in the region, we didn't even go to the mapping workshops. We trained two people that we worked with to, to, to run the mapping workshop, to, to, to taught them how, how to work. And this is, this is Kempi, who worked with me in the region. And uh, he's really picking up this idea of how you work in this participative manner. <laughs> so just uh, lie, lie on the ground and relax. So after we've drawn the maps, that's only the first stage because you can present one of these hand-drawn maps to the government department that's managing oil concessions or to the directors of the oil companies working in the Amazon. It doesn't mean anything to them because they don't understand the way that indigenous people see their land. So our challenge is trying to turn those maps into geo-reference maps that can be understood by anybody. So after drawing, we go around with GPSs. And we walk along the different walks through the territory. And we try and take GPS points, as many points as we can, that were drawn on, the, uh, on those hand-drawn maps that you saw. And again, it's um, something that we don't have to do. It's something that every community, we train two young guys how to use a GPS and how to log down every single point. And, they, and we leave them for two or three months in their communities and they go around and with their old people, with the hunters, with the people that know the territory and they do several walks, taking, uh, basically producing geographic pegs that you can hook the hand-drawn maps onto and position them. We go away and in a, back in Lima or sometimes in the field in a tent with a solar panel running outside, enter all that data into a computer, into a GIS, into a mapping software. And we cross-reference it with digitized images of the river networks in Peru. We create our own river networks by using elevation data from, from NASA. We use landsat images where you can see um, some of the hills, you can see some of the wetland areas, you can see some of the changes in vegetation and identify some of the things they've drawn. And we take it back to the community and we show them what we've got. First stage is normally pretty poor. We normally make a lot of errors. The names are incorrect. And there are a lot of big holes where people drew everything in one corner of the map because they didn't have space. So we go back and we check it and we add to it and we go into more detail and work in small groups uh, with particular people that know particular areas. In this work in Guyana, um, I took a, a laptop in the field and we started using the laptop to try and help identify different places. And the, it really helped um, the people around figuring out what we're talking about and how things related to each other. This is a, an image that we put together. This is a, we created a 3D model of the savannas in southern Guyana. The purple that you see are, are bush areas, and you can see the mountains here and you can see the rivers. We were working with this old guy to try and identify the names of the different peaks of this mountain and which way his path went up the mountains and what the names of each of the streams coming down were. And once we were able to pr present the information in this way, we could understand the relationship between what he'd drawn and what we had on the computer that, uh, and how it related to the GPS points we'd taken. 
the result is this is the actual territory, but this is how the government sees it. This is a uh, Lot 64, Talisman, it's a, a Canadian company that's trying to work there. And this is the, the, the petroleum concession that they have bought from the government. And it, it's unlikely that in the government maps even the communities appear. But this just appears like an empty space where they're working as far from many of the communities. As far as it, just looking at this map, it doesn't look like anybody lives there or it's going to affect anyone. There are no roads, there's no infrastructure. It's empty rainforest. So as a result of all that mapping work, this is one of the outputs. The whole area, the same area that you just saw, filled with everything that the communities drew and everything they visited. And in the detail, there's so much detail that it's hard to even position on a map. And when you, when you, only when you look in, you can see the names of all the streams, the hunting grounds, the gardens, where they get roofing palms from. Every, and the idea of this map is try to replicate as much as we can the hand-drawn maps, the communication potential of the hand-drawn maps. And not produce something technical, but produce something that communicates something, which is showing that this area is, um, is important for indigenous people, shows that it's not empty, and demonstrates their rights to the area. And what we produce are tools, maps, which the people can use as tools to show why this is important to them, and they use as tools to claim their rights, to go to the government and say, we want this recognized. We have internationally recognized rights to this territory, and we want the government to recognize that, and we want the oil companies to go in and not to go in there. And sometimes it's not even a legal issue. Sometimes just showing shareholders or company directors from these oil companies, when you can actually show them how their operations are affecting people and try to communicate that, a map is one tool that you can really help to show how, this, how these operations are affecting people. It communicates out to the general public. With this whole issue of territory, of petroleum exploration, of extractive industries, is a really hot and important issue in Peru at the moment. Over the last uh, two years, the government has been pursuing a really aggressive policy of... Uh, expanding industry into the Amazon, making money out the Amazon, which they see as uh, the president of Peru himself has a discourse that he wrote into the national newspapers called El Perador de Lord de Lano, the dog in the manger, basically equivalating indigenous people as kind of the story of the dog in the manger, that dogs that won't let anyone else to use the hay but have nothing to do with hay themselves. They, they see the jungle as wasted, a wasted opportunity. They see an, an indigenous people as an obstruction to development. And with that, they've been implementing a whole series of new laws. In the context of the free trade agreement, which has just been signed with the US, it's all about promoting investment and development in the Amazon. And been promoting more extractive industries, take, reducing indigenous people's rights, which makes it easier for a company to come in and start operating without having to go through all the hassle of dealing with a local community. And this really has driven the indigenous people to desperation in um, April this year, uh, indigenous people across the, the Amazon just had enough. They were fed up with being ignored and excluded, of not having control about their own future, about the expanding mining, oil, and biofuel plantations, and the way that the government was taking away their land rights, and they weren't recognizing their land rights. And Thousands and thousands of indigenous people from all over the Amazon, from all different ethnic groups, and speaking different languages in different places, started protesting. They first started protesting, going around the local jungle towns, shouting, and they were doing that for weeks, shouting outside government offices, and the government simply ignored them. They wouldn't even speak to the leaders in Lima. I remember a phone call I had with one local re leader who phoned me after several weeks, and it was, I could hear the shouting in the background, and he said, Greg, I'm really worried. The government isn't listening. It's not paying attention to us. We've got to do something else to make them listen. So they went and they closed down the roads and the rivers and the airports throughout the Amazon. And they stopped the transport of uh, personnel for the oil operations. They closed down the pipeline that runs across northern Peru from the Corrientes operations, which I showed you, all the way to the coast. And for two months, they, they stood there, they blockaded, and the entire thing was peaceful. For me, it was one of the incredible social movement 
And one that, the kind of thing that's not heard about, the press isn't interested in a peaceful social movement. For two months, thousands and thousands of people were protesting every day, many, uh, many miles from their homes, and they managed to keep the whole thing peaceful. They managed to, when you've got so many young people and so many people with a lot of anger, the fact that they managed to maintain order and peace for the whole thing was, uh, I think, really special. Unfortunately, though, on the 5th of June this year, uh, in a particular area of northern Peru uh, called uh, Bawa, where indigenous people have been blockading a road, 3,000 indigenous people, along with people from the local towns who are mestizos and mixed race people, have been blockading the road. And the government decided that it had enough and sent in uh, 600 armed police to open the road and stop the protest. The police went in with force. They started shooting on people and firing. The whole operation lasted the entire morning. Uh, over 200 indigenous people were wounded and hospitalized with gunshot wounds. Over um, at least 34 people died, including policemen. Because of, once you start shooting, that's just the spark that sets off the violence. It's impossible to, uh, for people to maintain the, the calm and the peace after the shooting starts. And the police used excessive force uh, and brutally and attacked uh, the indigenous people there. The day that attacks happened, I just arrived in Peru. Um, I, I now work for Amazon Watch, based in San Francisco, and we do campaign and media work for indigenous people. And just before this happened, we were, um, I, I, it was Tuesday that week, the, the attack, the, this, this happened on Friday. Uh, I just woke up knowing that we had to get out there because something was going to happen. I, I, we'd made a decision Tuesday, I flew out on Wednesday, on Friday, I was in Lima, in the indigenous organization office in Lima. These photos were taken by uh, a, a Belgian couple, Mariki and Thomas, uh, young, I think they're 22, 23, who happened to be there. And they were phoning me up. During the day, I could hear gunshots and explosions in the background, and they're phoning me up and giving me the latest information, which I was passing on to the Amazon Watch team in San Francisco when they were passing it on to the media. At that point, the, it was the only source of any other story about, uh, about what was happening. The government story was that indigenous people had attacked the police and had savagely, brutally murdered policemen. No word was about the actual history, about the fact that this had been a peaceful operation and about the, that it was a police attacking the indigenous people. So we spread the words. Uh, Thomas and Maraiki sent me the photos of that afternoon when they got to an intercafe and we put them out. And I got there the next morning with the aim of trying to get the message out, trying to get the, make sure that there was an alternative story, that the people in the area were able to get their message out. And again, um, it, it continues to amaze me how uh, technology can help us. This is a, I, a two-way Skype interview that I gave two days afterwards with Democracy Now!, which is a, um, a US uh, internet-based channel. They had me on live Skype two-way the night before. These images I had downloaded, I copied across with a cable from a, 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 journal, a local journalist that I'd found on the streets that day. And we sat down on a street corner and copied across his images onto my camera. I uploaded them to Amazon Watch uh, that evening, and they passed them on to the media channels, and then they, they put this together. So just two days afterwards, we were able to have live information, and we were able to get alternative stories out and give the people there an opportunity to tell their side of the story. Um, so part of it's about media and it's, it's about communication. It's about providing people with the tools that they can claim their rights and they pr can protest without ha having to resort to that. Part of our work is about trying to provide alternative means that indigenous people can claim their rights, that they can complain about what's happening and try to change things. One of the other things we've been doing, as well as the mapping, is uh, monitoring of petrol companies. So uh, in this, re this is back to Corrientes, where the oil contamination is happening. I believe one of the main reasons this has happened for 35 years is that it goes on hidden. No one is, no one is talking about it. The company can basically do what they want, because 
No one is ever going to tell them off. No one is ever going to find out. So what we've been doing is training local guys to use GPSs as well and document the oil spills and document the historical contamination. And it's about showing the world what are the consequences of oil operations in the Amazon, what is the consequence of this model of development and how indigenous people are suffering. And they're using video and cameras and they're all over the, these remote parts of the Amazon, which would take you six or seven days to if you wanted to get there from the outside, by that which time the oil spill would be gone. And they're there in the region, and they're able to film this, send down the tape or the memory card downriver, and it gets to the central office where we've trained, again, two indigenous guys about how to use a Mac, how to use iMovie, and they put together a documentation of all the oil spills that have happened, with the photos, with uh, details about where the spill happened, what date the spill happened, the, uh, the co coordinates with the location. And that information makes sure that the uh, government department responsible for controlling oil companies hears about it. It makes sure that it gets out in the media. It tries to embarrass the oil company. It tries to send the message, whatever you do here is going to get out there. And the aim is, we, we're still sending it up, is that these spills will be on YouTube within a week or two of them actually happening. Uh, we've, got, we've got some YouTube videos up, which aren't public yet, but uh, it's a long process to train people. But now we have a huge database of over 5,000 images and tons of video. Uh, the local guys are trained about how to use iMovie and trained about how to upload it onto YouTube. And they've been experimenting that, with over, that over the last few months this year. And uh, the aim is that any oil company, anything they do, it'll be up on YouTube. It'll be spread around the world. and it's hope is that this will really bring the oil companies to account and it's about empowering the people there to bring the oil companies to account. Um, and just finishing off, um, I mean the other side of this, I didn't really introduce myself completely at the beginning, I wanted to talk about the Achamar mainly, um, but this work was something I was involved with for seven years whilst living in Peru. I was running, a, 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 well, co-directing an organization that I founded uh, with some friends. We went out there in 2000 uh, doing this kind of work, the mapping work, the monitoring work, empowering indigenous people, helping them get their message out. Since January this year, I've been working for an organization, Amazon Watch, based in San Francisco. I'm the Peru coordinator, and I'm working on exactly the same issues. But we are another part of the jigsaw. Uh, Part of it is about the media. These, this information that comes from the field is about publicizing it, it's about helping give these people access to international media or blogs, because often nowadays you know, the, the mainstream media doesn't want to cover these stories. But you can do a, a lot with, uh, with blogs, with Facebook, with Twitter. You can get the message out. And once you build up the momentum, the mainstream media starts to pick it up. And we help indigenous people come to Lima, uh, sorry, come to the US. This is the Occidental Petroleum Shareholder Meeting. We've been working with Earth Rights International in the Achwa to, to bring a court case against Oxy for the damage that they left in this region and to force them to pay up. You may have heard of a similar court case that have also been running in Ecuador against Chevron for the damage they left in, in, in Ecuador. That court case has been running, I, I think, it was well over a decade. And it's currently looking like Chevron is going to be fined $27 billion or something in that region for the damage they left. And then we've got a similar court case going against Doxy. And this is about bringing the leaders to the company directors but also to the shareholders and letting them know what their company is involved in. And we work a lot with the shareholders of the company, trying to get them to pressure their company to be more responsible and to, be, and to implement policies maybe in some cases not work in these kind of areas where indigenous people just don't want them and it's too fragile. And in other areas, force a company to pay up and face the consequences of their history and clean up the mess that they left and pay for the health problems that they've caused. So it's about introducing the leaders, also about using media. This is a, a young celebrity, Korianka Kilcher, who um, is uh, 19 years old now. I think she's only 17 here. Uh, she was in a film with Colin Farrell called The New World. She's half Peruvian and she came to us wanting to know how she can help. And having a celebrity 
Uh, unfortunately, the way of the world, people really listen to it when you've got a celebrity and you get media coverage. And it's great when you get people like this who will stand up and help get the message out and they help indigenous people get their message out about how they're being affected. I wanted to just finish up then saying, um, I mean, it's, the Amazon is under huge threat. The scale of things now is unprecedented. It's, um, well, I mean, perhaps in the rubber boom a century ago, the Amazon was invaded to the similar scale, and we know that millions of indigenous people died during that time. Uh, the environment wasn't destroyed. People were tapping just rubber trees. Now it's a new frontier. Oil exploration is covering most of the Peruvian Amazon. Mining is covering a lot of the areas around the edge of the mountains. Biofuels is a new thing, and the company is looking to clear areas of rainforest to plant to make biofuels plantations to meet the biofuels markets. It's a pretty horrific picture, but at the same time, um, there's a lot of um, opportunity. There's a, I'm very optimistic about what we can actually do because we have so many more tools available to us there than, we could before, than we did before. The fact that we can travel and we can meet the directors of the company with these indigenous people, we can connect people. The fact that communication technologies, digital cameras in the field, it would have been impossible to do the monitoring we did even five years ago. Digital cameras are pretty, are pretty new in the way, they work, the way you have them now. The fact that we have waterproof digital cameras out there. Imagine trying to take a photo and get that developed without it getting wet. And, and try, when you have a photo in the middle of a jungle town, how do you then get that message out to anybody, get that to the press? So the internet and, uh, and some of these video and, uh, technologies, the fact that you can have a computer that an indigenous person can manage and make a, uh, put together a short video and put it on YouTube on. Uh, it, it provides so many opportunities and there's so many ideas about what we can do, about how we can bring these companies to account, that we can empower indigenous people and give them a more of an active role in their future. And also it's positive because the Amazon is still beautiful. It hasn't been destroyed. There are people there who are living very happily uh, some of the happiest people in the world, I think, that uh, can go hunting and fishing, and their land is still full of natural resources. We hear about the struggle of rural life. Well, here is a situation where, in many cases, they continue to, to live in their territory as I had it years ago. It's only now that it's starting to become encroached upon. But up to now, they still have all the resources they need to live. And they live very well, and as you can see, they're all very healthy. And they can uh, eat, it just takes going out from one hour from the communities to go and uh, find enough fish to feed your entire family. So things are still good. There's a lot that we can do to, uh, to try and keep them that way, to put the future more in the hands of the indigenous people that live there. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm really hoping that we can continue uh, doing something and at least making some effort to try and, uh, and, and stop making the same mistakes that we've made in other places of the world. And, and keep something special about the Amazon.